another podcast of the People and Dance Floors Project. Uh, this is me, Julia. You've heard me before, and I am so thrilled today to um, have somebody who's really close to my heart as guest. Uh, her name is Marta Santuccio, and she's a good friend, and we've known each other for a very long time. <laughs> and we met uh, many, many years ago uh, when we were in sixth form, and uh, we got close partly through uh, raving together. Uh, so uh, my very first experiences of raves were with Marta, and uh, I'm privileged to have uh, kept in touch with her over the years and to have witnessed her journey, uh, which involves a lot of searching. And I think her formal searching has involved kind of education. So um, she's doing a PhD in philosophy. And she also does a more kind of embodied form of searching through um, being a practitioner in breath work. So I find this in super interesting and I'm so glad that you could join us today, Marta. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Hello, Julia. Hi, everyone. And thank you for having me on your podcast. It's a great honor to do this with you and to be able to talk to you in this um, environment. Yay. So, um, so yeah, I guess the first thing that I'm, I was going to ask you is to really tell me a little bit more about what inspired you to, uh, to do the work that you do now. So obviously there's a dual thing of doing a PhD as well as uh, working to become an embodied practitioner. So yeah, just tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, so um, as you said, I've always been a searcher. I've always really been, I've always had a really strong drive to um, explore consciousness to explore myself and to explore the layers of myself, my thoughts, my emotions that sort of live beneath the day-to-day -day state of consciousness that um, sort of drives our lives. So this, like my passion, I'm this being a consciousness freak is something that I've been since I'm a child. And then obviously as I grew up, I started studying um, various uh, meditation practices, various various types of like meditation and embodiment practices from like Tibetan meditation to shamanic rituals. And more recently, I started doing something called holotropic breath work. And um, obviously this together with my PhD, I'm, my PhD um, is um, my PhD research is basically um, a research in the metaphysics of consciousness. So trying to understand how consciousness uh, exists within um, the scientific picture of the world that constitutes the paradigm, at least for us in philosophy. And um, so these two areas of research, of personal research and academic research have been, are two big, big, big pillars of um, my practice as, a, as an embodied transformation and breathwork um, facilitator. But something that has been extremely important in uh, my formation as a practitioner is my own personal sort of healing process, um, my own personal healing process. So at a certain point in my life, I realized I was not happy. Um, anxiety was eating me alive and um, I just needed to bring about a change. So what I did is um, together with going to therapy, I also started sort of looking at all the embodied practices, at all of the various experiences that I had in my life and using them for therapeutic pur purposes. So using them as ways to get to know myself, mm -hmm. to use, using them as ways to get to know myself, to get to know my emotion and to learn to live with myself, to learn mm -hmm. to love myself, to learn to feel my emotions. Mm -hmm. And so my interest became really my way out of my mental let's say dark space mm. and this together with my academic research on consciousness has created what is now my method for doing embodied transformation mm. so i would say research and searching both outside and inside are the main inspiration and the driving forces of my practice and of my life <laughs> Uh, that's so nice. It's such a fascinating and uh, I think quite um, quite insightful way, I think, of looking at uh, the potentials for research and for seeking, uh, which are both internal and external, which are both formal as well as maybe, uh, I, I want to say informal, but 
I guess, you know, there's something about uh, kind of working outside of certain schemes or certain yeah. kind of rigidity, the rigidity of certain schemes, which are is important, as well as, uh, you know, often in academia, you know, we're taught to use uh, reason over emotions and we're taught to kind of stick with the kind of the mind over the body. In fact, the body is neglected and is kind of hunched over a computer and it doesn't get any any sort of attention. And I think that, you know, that's potentially, you know, can be really harmful to us. Uh, and also uh, it can limit the scope of our research, of our seeking, of our understanding. Yeah, yeah very much. So I actually want to uh, say two things about this. The first one is that the idea of um, being able to see beyond the scheme uh, for me has been an extremely important um, part of my methodology, both my methodology as a seeker, so both in my personal and my academic uh, career. So when I do philosophy, I am using all of the phys philosophical uh, reasoning techniques, but it is my practice as an embodied pr practitioner that is imbuing my uh, academic research with my practice as an embodied practitioner that really allows me to push the debate forward to make an original contribution. And in the same key, looking beyond the schemes that um, that society sort of imposes, and I don't mean it negative, ne necessarily negatively, mm -hmm. but looking beyond the scheme, and finding a way to look at myself beyond the scheme that I built around myself in order to be a functional member of society, because that's how I learned to be a functional member of society, was really the key for me to uh, develop, for, was develop or continue seeking or get better. Mm, mm. So I, I think you you really hit the nail the nail on its head with the idea of looking outside of the schemes. Mm, mm, yeah, and I think there's lots of different ways in which we do do that or we try to do that. Or, although sometimes, uh, you know, we are restricted within because we have to work within certain parameters. But I think you know my my experience, personal experience, has been that uh, there are certain things, certain experiences, which help us to step outside or to to feel and experience things differently uh you know alternate states of consciousness or you know alternative experiences some of which are drug induced but not necessarily they don't have to be some of them i think drugs can be a really good way to enter into an alternative space of experience and consciousness and of course there are other ways too and i guess i'm interested in um yeah in asking you about whether um you, you know what role if any, drugs have had to inspire uh, a different, uh, a, your different kind of embodied understanding of something and then kind of led you on to having these kind of ideas to apply uh, elsewhere and in other, in other modes, in other ways. Okay, so this is a really interesting question because I've actually been thinking about this a lot, um, especially in relation to the fact that what I do now, the embodied experience the, that I lead my clients through are very similar to the experiences that we have when we have drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, I'm going to answer the first question first and mm -hmm. then we can come back to this later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, drugs have had a um, very important impact on my development, both as a person and as a thinker, as an academic thinker. Yeah, on my way of thinking. And the reason why they had a strong impact is because they allowed me to really experience what it meant for me to be myself at that time. Mm -hmm. So when I took drugs for the first few times and I went dancing, what happened was that um, the schemes dissipated in a mm. certain sense and I was left alone <laughs> with my own self mm. I was inside my skin I mm. could experience the world not mentally the way like the way we do in the everyday so mm -hmm. it wasn't about problem solving and navigating the outside world mm -hmm. but it was much more about feeling mm -hmm. myself being myself so this was um something that I had been looking for, 
some experience it was very reminiscent of some experiences that i had as a child mm-hmm. when you're free of this the schemes when you're free to just you know you're sad and you just cry you're happy and you just laugh mm-hmm. so when that sort of freedom that you can have as a child definitely i i did find it again with drugs and mm-hmm. by taking drugs and dancing with music which were you know like my encounter with drugs is mm-hmm. impossible to separate with my real encounter with music and mm-hmm. in that sort of context um i really learned what it meant to let go of the day to day mind and drop into the body mm-hmm. so obviously this was also paired it became paired with various other interests that i had at the time so i was really into music anyways and i knew how to listen to music in a certain way that it are but this was a great like but yeah this this is something that drugs really brought into my life the ability the understanding that hey i'm a body and i can actually navigate life through my body mm. and the second things i think that drugs brought um to my life was the ability to communicate with other people in a way that was once again <laughs> free of those schemes in a way mm-hmm. that was more authentic so i could be authentic and i could show and by being authentic around other people i was accepted by other mm-hmm. people and other people were also authentic so the level of communication the way that we started relating to one another sort of occurred in a way that was totally different to the way that we would relate if we met in a, at school or mm-hmm. in a completely different situation and it wasn't different because we were all thinking because in you like because usually we think oh my god this is how i have to behave it was just more fluid it was just more honest mm-hmm. and whether i was crying or whether i was happy all mm-hmm. of my emotions were just accepted i was accepted whether i was good or i was bad happy or mm-hmm. ugly or pretty it mm-hmm. just after him or what mattered was this embodied connection mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. vibe this feeling that we shared yeah i i really that's beautiful and i really wanted to kind of uh just uh flesh out there um something that i thought about immediately when you were talking is that relational aspect so it's about the relation to the self and 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 one's body and it's about the relation to others around us as well uh and the ability to um to 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 have that quality of relation that is free of um any kind of constraints uh in that moment uh can be potentially uh, you know really powerful even healing in terms of or at least inspiring to um yeah to maybe uh you know to 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 see oneself uh differently to experience oneself differently and to also to be able to uh communicate with others and i feel like you know that's so much of what you were saying really resonates with uh the stories uh that some of the people and the people and dance first film kind of uh bring up uh as well as uh although i think you've said it in a in a much more uh in a much more kind of eloquent and authoritative way with <laughs> with that sort of uh, you know with 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 you know with the mind of a good thinker but it's like <laughs> you know it's it's that same thing that people kind of like touch upon over and over again when they talk about you know the feeling of connectedness the kind of death of the ego that sort of stuff uh that people talk about all the time when they talk about um uh, uh drug experiences particularly i would say probably with drugs like mdma or acid yeah. although probably not exclusively but yeah uh so yeah so so i i guess my next question would be um Uh, are are there any ways in which or you know maybe you could you could draw on an example or you could just tell me a bit more in general whether um the drug experiences or drug use has uh, informed your kind of professional practice or your kind of uh, either in 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 philosophy or in 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 um, in sort of embodied facilitation of of uh, breathwork sessions for example yeah So I would say yes because my work is so connected to my experience as a human being so to my personal life um I would say um no tell me the question again <laughs> <laughs> So basically I guess I'm interested in like because i remember we had a conversation in the past about um uh for instance that 
you know, a lot of the your first experience of going to a breathwork um, session uh, when you did, did like a kind of group session and that some of what you experienced was very similar to what you had experienced uh, while on LSD, for example. I think I remember that, so, that sort of thing. So I was wondering whether, you know, the, the experiences that you had on drugs are, are directly kind of informed uh, maybe some of the practices that, you, that you've developed uh, it, professionally uh, or, you know, either in like uh, you know, the philosophical thinking or, yeah, you got that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got it. I just, I just started thinking and then I got confused, but yeah, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get lost in my own mind sometimes. So I, I would say, first of all, I want to um, say something that I think is really important. And it's that for me, the use of uh, drugs, of party drugs, and especially in relation to like using drugs in the dance floor, et cetera, et cetera. For me, it's always been a practice. Right. So I, I, I'm not saying that I always took drugs in a completely like controlled manner, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, every time I took drug, it was about going through a process. It was about going through a journey. So in this sense, um, what I do now, the embodied transformation uh, experiences that I offer people is reminiscent of drug in that sense is because it is a process of going deep within and getting to know and getting to know yourself. Now, obviously, like for me, finding drug, finding drugs or doing drugs has been great because it really allowed me to have these sort of deep experiences that I was anyway trying to have in researching outside of drugs as well with various like meditation and shamanic practices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But something that drug that the drugs and these other kind of research allowed me to do is to be able to see this in-depth experience and the scheme within which we cannot have these experiences right mm -hmm. so what we do in my practice now is <laughs> trying to facilitate an experience of deep self-exploration mm -hmm. that is not about sort of destroying the constraints or destroying the boundaries that we have mm -hmm. but they're more about how can we have those sort of experiences and integrate them mm -hmm. in the everyday where we do have these constraints because mm -hmm. they are important mm -hmm. so why did i say that for me drug experiences were always like journeys mm -hmm. because when you do a journey you have a purpose you have an intention mm -hmm. in that journey and for me the intention maybe was to release emotions or to mm -hmm. understand i don't know x y z right mm -hmm. and within this process within this journey it was never about it it was never about oh let's break let's you know let's break all the constraints that we have but it was about finding some constraints that are appropriate to my situation so it's not like i went out and took drugs and wanted to smash glasses mm. instead you know instead i didn't lose constraints but i used the constraints that i have in the everyday mm. and i sort of danced around them i looked at them in different ways through experiencing them through experiencing mm -hmm. myself within them mm -hmm. so what this had a great has a big impact on how I looked at how I look at life. So mm -hmm. I would I, I guess I had this kind of mentality before. So for me, the drugs just helped me to really explore this better. Mm -hmm. But the practice that I like in the experiences that I offer now, the similar the similar the similarities are obviously the mm -hmm. inner journey. Mm -hmm. the ability to bring this inner journey or integrate this inner journey mm -hmm. in everyday life and it's about understanding the constraint the societal familial constraint the constraints that we put on our own selves mm -hmm. learn to work with them so mm -hmm. for me it's revolution this process is a revolutionary process but it's not revolutionary because it destroys mm -hmm. what before but it's revolutionary because it, the revolution is in the act of acceptance is in the act of understanding is in mm -hmm. the act of embodying those constraints mm -hmm. and by embodying them, you make them yours. Mm. So, for example, you know, morality. We can mm. look at morality in two different ways. You know that you that it's not good to steal, and you can learn this as a rule that mm. is, you know, sort of imposed on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Morality can be something that you can find inside. You don't want to steal because you understand that it's not nice to take things away from other people. Mm -hmm. 
So, <laughs> yeah. This is, I, I think this is a good analogy because mm. it's a good analogy between like what happens with drugs and what I did, this, this relationship between, you know, the external world and, you know, the, the framework within which we work, mm -hmm. that very often is not a framework that other people gave us or society gave us, you know, we build our own frameworks to mm -hmm. fit in that wider framework, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then we build our own jail and both mm -hmm. in drugs and in my in, in the experiences that I create for my clients, it's all about working mm -hmm. with things, make, seeing what you did and what comes from outside and integrating mm -hmm. them into a life that is more authentic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Um, I like that idea of uh, authenticity, <laughs> especially because I think so much of our um, struggles, you know, internal struggles are also given by the fact that we are not uh, fully uh, allowed we're not we're not given permission to even be honest with ourselves about what's going on and so that work of integrating that you were talking about is so difficult to do when we're you know we're already put ourselves in our own prison we imprison ourselves like you said yeah. um, and I think you know I think from you know from many people have reported that drug experiences can be healing and can allow, uh, you know, the the integration of those experiences, those th that freedom into other aspects of, of one's life. Uh, then, then you know, and and you know, basically creating enhancement uh, outside of the of the drug experience itself. Which is why I think you know we're really trying to overcome, or um, you know, kind of yeah, overcome, or or maybe. We're, we're past those labels where we talk we talk about drugs just as recreational, just as fun or just as, you know, it's like, it's, I think it's important to have, to, to, that we talk about those layers of complexity that uh, allow for the drug experience uh, to be, you know, not just one thing and not just for one purpose. And so I liked your description of the journey and it's yeah. certainly something that also resonates with me. And I remember going on a few journeys together, which, of which course. was always really fun. <laughs> I remember this too, and I can't <laughs> wait for us to have more. I actually wanted to say that the search for authenticity is something that I, I, I think motivates very much both my own personal path as a person and also my research as a philosopher and my work as an embodied practi practitioner. But it's something that, but this search is something that I find in this need for coming back home to ourselves is something that I find very often in conversation with my peers even or even with older people or younger people. It's something that keeps coming up and it's definitely a really strong motivation for uh, the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think something that is incredibly interesting is how, you know, the healing business or this more new, new age uh, market, mm. you know, um, it all revolves around finding authenticity. Authenticity is like a massive buzzword right mm. now because we all are looking for it because it's obvious that the way that we grew up, you know, the system has been developing for a long mm. time and then there comes time in history when changes occur and the change that our generation is looking for revolves very much around authenticity and obviously like practices like embodied practices, but also practices like conscious drug taking or like psychedelic experiences are a big part of it. And I think something that is extremely interesting is how if you look at the healing market, mm, mm. a big chunk of the healing market um, actually revolves around the use of drugs, psiloglobin, acid, mm -hmm. MDMA, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for therapeutic purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I'm not just referring to people at King's College or Imperial mm -hmm. who are doing research for, okay, people who have trauma or da da da, mm. but a lot of the people, like a lot of people that are looking for themselves are going for ayahuasca journeys or are mm -hmm. going to do psiloglobin in like a certain community setting mm -hmm. or, and they are exactly the same people that will come to me to mm -hmm. do embodied practices or mm -hmm. they go to my friend who is doing uh, I don't know coaching or mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. it's one and the same really for me like one of the reasons why it's so exciting for me to talk to you especially is because the line like within the wellness business the mm -hmm. line between a drug-led experience and a sober mm -hmm. sort of 
journey is extremely mm. blurred. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And most of the drug is not stigmatized, it's not used as, you know, oh, you're taking the drug. It's all about the journey that you're on. Mm-hmm. And you can use different methodologies. And mm-hmm. the use of the drug is just one of the methodologies that are available right now in mm-hmm. the search for authenticity, in the search mm-hmm. for you to really integrate, to be mm-hmm. yourself, to mm-hmm. be yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, completely. I, I see that uh, very clearly. And I guess I think a part of me, I mean, this is kind of like a related, maybe uh, maybe slightly unrelated point, <laughs> but I've got I've got some some a, a slight issue with the idea that it is only drug use that is medicalized or, or that is legitimated for medical purposes, which is granted to people as something therapeutic or potentially life-saving, uh, whereas other types of experiences uh, for, are considered to be, uh, you know, hierarchically lower and therefore not sound. So a personal experience, uh, for instance, uh, uh, that is driven by the individual uh, and and the self-reported therapeutic nature of that experience is not necessarily necessarily considered to be valid. Obviously, that's not to say that we shouldn't have clinical trials. It's just (laughs) more about trying to also validate and legitimize people's own seeking of uh, of change, of of healing, of of working with their own traumas in the ways that they, uh, you know, in the ways that they want to explore uh, without telling them, you know, what they can and can't do (laughs) so yeah yeah. but of course the other side of that is you know sometimes uh you know people get into harmful you know um cycles or into harmful practices and potentially those harmful practices that do also involve drug use do also involve certain drugs and so you know obviously i'm not you know we we shouldn't uh deny that or we shouldn't uh you know uh we shouldn't pretend like it doesn't exist um, but yeah, I think, you know, may- maybe it's a good time to, to talk a little bit about harm because, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess that's important. Well, that's central to me. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I guess this is the question I ask everyone. What, what does harm reduction mean to you? OK, so, well, harm reduction for me obviously means like minimizing the consequences that harmful, um, well, harmful mm, activities have on your life and on society. Um, I find it hard to think about um, harm reduction in the standard sense because I don't necessarily think that if we're talking about drugs in this case, that the use of drug is harmful per se. (laughs) So this topic for me is a bit complicated to tackle just because I probably have a different uh, perspective on how the notion of harm redu- or of harm mm. is conceived. But um, in my utopic ideal world, or if I could, you know, like really, okay, so my view on harm reduction is that the best way, the best approach to harm reduction right now is inclusion. Mm. Right. So for me, an, a harm reduction method, a harm reduction policy, a harm reduction process is a process that involves um, uh, community understanding. And by understanding, I mean understanding of the self and of uh, the other and acceptance. Mm. And the reason why I talk about harm reduction in terms of inclusion, about understa- self-understanding and community and understanding of the other and acceptance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is because of the reason why we go and do party drugs okay so we don't do party drugs just because we want to have fun Mm. i mean some people do it just because they want to have fun and sometimes we just do it for fun but there are so many layers Mm. so we can stop at the first layer and we can say oh okay you are gonna take some ecstasy while you go dancing and this is really dangerous and it is really dangerous if you're just looking at it like that but then you have to start peeling the layers and you really look at why people want to have fun like that and again it goes back to authenticity it goes back to being able to embody yourself to allow yourself to accept the fact that ah oh, you're feeling so sad right now and you feel it on your skin or ah oh, you're feeling so happy and you can express mm. it with your body right so It is this that really draws us to the drugs, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which then may cause harm. But a policy of harm reduction that has that has inclusion as it at its center. It's a policy that allows us to find what we find in the dance floor, what we find when we take that uh, drugs on dance floor, for example, elsewhere. Mm. So my use, for example, of 
party drugs has diminished very, very much the more um, I created myself spaces, communities, practices that allowed me to drop in my body, mm. to accept myself, to love myself, and then communicate who I was without shame, without judgment, which is a major feature of the dance floor, of taking mm. drugs on the dance floor. No one is judging you, no one cares, really. Mm. Everyone just wants to be themselves, everyone just wants to express and wants to dance. Mm. So harm reduction for me is this, is the creation of spaces where experiences that are similar in matrix to those that we seek through drugs can be had without drugs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really like this vision. Um, it really resonates because often, you know, I think about it in a more maybe traditional political way about inclusion. You know, I, I, what you said about inclusion really resonates, but I guess my interpretation of inclusion as applied to the harm reduction or drug policy context, it's like it's about creating inclusive communities of discussion, of debate. And that's how I sort of interpret it in a more traditional sense. But I love I love that vision of like if we if we create more inclusive experience and if we are allowed to express our emotions and to be ourselves and to exude in every environment then obviously you know we want we won't be seeking for that for that extra thing that helps us to do it um you know or or, or maybe we still will but maybe not as much yeah. so yeah and i yeah i guess yeah that's 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 beautiful lovely <laughs> i i guess i guess Mm, a really important part of my practice that is something that is something that I also found in the drug experience is the idea of being embodied. So when I talk about authenticity, I'm talking about being embodied. Okay. So what's the issue? The, the issue is that in the everyday life, we work through off of our minds. We problem solve our emotions, like we problem solve, you know, logistics at work. So everything comes as a mental process. And this is great for certain aspects of our life like if you're at work if you have to teach a class if you have to organize travel that's great but when we jump into the emotional sphere that's not so good because emotions are physical process are embodied processes they have a mental mm -hmm, sort of aspect and they have a physical bodily aspect as well right so when we process emotions mentally what happens is we think that we have processed them, but we haven't really processed them. They are still in our bodies. Mm. But once we connect to our bodies, and this is something that, you know, taking drug forces you to be in your body because you take MDMA and you feel all of these like tingles here and there. And, you know, you see more colors and you hear more music and your heart is beating a certain way. Mm. You're forced to be in your body. OK. Mm. And it is the process of embodiment of being in your body that allows you to express, to accept, to understand and to express, exude who mm. you are. Mm. And this is what happens with drugs. And this is what happens in my practice. Mm -hmm. And this is what harm reduction should be. Should mm. Harm reduction for me is an or the creating of community. Yes, we should talk about harm reduction. We should talk about the harm, how people are taking drugs, what it means. Mm. But really what we have to create is a, is a space for people to come back home to their body, to mm. be humans. We're not intellectual creatures. We're also intellectual creatures, but not just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about things as much as we want but there is this other aspect which is the experiential aspect of our life that needs to be brought back as an essential feature of how we're navigating our own lives and how we're building society mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> there, is only, there is only so much that your head can do and your body can do so much more <laughs> and it's your body is constantly working so we have two options we either ignore it and then, you know, it's going to age, it's going to wither, it's going to make you feel shitty, it's going to make you feel anxious, it's going to make you feel depressed. Or we start taking care of the fact that we also have a body and that's where we keep our emotion, that's where we, where ourselves really exist and we bring it in. And this will be harm reduction and it's not just harm reduction towards drugs, this is also, I think, a really important conversation that we need to have uh, with reference to mental health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I 100% agree with you there. Uh, I guess I've just I've just got I've just come up with um, something or something was kind of going around in my head as you were talking, and um, and I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot here, but often you'll get 
you'll get this kind of line of discussion, this line of argument that says some drugs are okay, but other drugs are bad because they're inherently uh, harmful. Like their characteristic qualities are much more likely to, uh, you know, uh, cause addiction or to like enslave people into cycles and so on and so forth. So is it worth, do you think, making a distinction between quote unquote good drugs and bad drugs? Or should we even kind of overcome that discussion and talk about something else entirely? So, because obviously, you know, some drugs have certain tendencies and uh, I, I think we all have experienced certain drugs as negative. I certainly p personally experienced cigarettes as <laughs> something that's very, very enslaving and something that I can't, <laughs> you know, I can't put down. And I know the harms of cigarettes. And I also feel like cigarettes themselves are not particularly beneficial to me other than for being a, a means of social communication, you know, like the whole, <laughs> let's go out for a cigarette, let's have a cigarette together and have a chat. So <laughs> that stuff, you know, is what got me hooked in the first place. But then, you know, all the other cigarettes that I have, you know, are not necessarily kind of good for me. And so, yeah, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I guess, uh, yeah, you know, is it worth, you know, uh, kind of going beyond the whole like good drugs and bad drugs discussion and kind of moving on to maybe something a little bit more subtle than that? Or should we keep some distinction? Okay, so yes, you do put me a little bit on the spot <laughs> with this question, but you know, okay, yeah, but you put me on the spot for a number of reasons, um, one of which is I'm going for a really rebellious phase of my life and I'm just like, no schemes, anarchy, <laughs> okay, not anarchy, but anyway, yes, and um, I, I, I do think that it, there are certain substances that are more harmful maybe than others, well, it's not the sun substance in themselves, but it's, it is the effect that it has on people. So certain it, it, within the context of talking about drugs as a journey and as, an, as, as, as a space to be embodied and to communicate, I think there are certain drugs that allow you to have a deeper experience of the self uh, or a deeper explorative experiences than others. So I think the conversation about, you know, like, this drug is better than the other is a drug i mean it's a conversation that it's definitely had like that definitely that that does need to be had but all of this conversation i think all need to be part of a wider conversation so it's you know classification of drug is it can be good maybe but it's a secondary point <laughs> because first we need to start understanding why we take drugs, how we take them and what they mean in our lives. Mm -hmm. And only after you understand this, then can you make a classification of, you know, whether drugs are, <laughs> whether one drug is better than the other. Mm -hmm. Then obviously there is another point and like another facet of this conversation that I think it's valuable to talk about and it's, you know, the addiction. Okay, so a lot of people see drugs as harmful because they can create addiction and it is true some drugs are more likely to create addiction like alcohol, cocaine are cases that are obvious in our generation, you know, we, we see them everywhere, we talk about people, we can see how many people are hooked on coke or on alcohol rather than as opposed to, you know, MDMA or acid. Mm. So that already speaks for itself, right? So there are certain substances that are, what I think is extremely interesting is that the substances that actually draw people into an addictive state are all of those sub substances that allow you to go less deep, deep mm. uh, into the exploration of yourself. So if I was a lawmaker and I had to <laughs> sort of, you know, <laughs> like classify drugs according to their harm, this is exactly what I would what I would be looking at. It, and the relationship between addiction and whether the drug is really bringing you to be embodied or disembodied. So in alcohol, you're disembodied, you, for, you black out, you forget about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, whereas yeah. in the MA, you, you just can't do yeah. that. <laughs> That's right. And I think it, it's, it's so interesting to me that like certain substances, are, you know, the, the ones where you where you can't get it, you have to stay at a superficial level. And it's all about sort of like superficial outside interaction. And it's uh, there's no. Yeah, you're right. There's, there's just no kind of depth of emotion necessarily that is that is brought by uh, 
by those substances and they tend to be the most popular they also tend to be the ones that go well with the system you know the capitalism the productivity and the yeah so yeah. they fit within the system so i think one of the greatest thanks that i'm gonna have to give to drugs and to like the party community is that going through these experiences have really encouraged me to question to raise questions about myself about what it what life is for me how i want to live life how can i change how can i help right questions like this like after like the integration of a drug experience of a drug journey like that involves raising these kind of questions mm -hmm. whereas using other types of drugs like let's call them shallow or drugs like mm -hmm. alcohol or coke are more are, like, they're, they're types of drugs where you tend to avoid yourself avoid your emotions mm -hmm. and they fit within a system the, the system more easily because this is exactly how the system is at the moment this is exactly why practices like my practice my embodied practice is necessary because as i said before we process everything through the mind mm -hmm. when a bad uncomfortable emotion comes we process it out, we don't want to feed it. And drugs, like addictive drugs, like the ones we have mentioned before, have exactly this kind of effect. They, they are avoidance drugs. Yeah. You don't feel, you act. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, th I think this is like a very, very salient difference between the two types mm. of experiences. One, one is about life, the other one is about avoiding, it's about forgetting, it's about not feeling. Mm. And they're very different experiences. They're not the experience, the, 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 ex the type of experience that you go and seek at a party. Like mm. if you go to the dance floor, you will not see avoid people that are avoiding. You will see a totally different... Yeah, I mean, you, you will definitely see people emote. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. <laughs> yeah. I think I that's that. one of the reasons that you know that keep you know that brings us brings me back to to dance floors is definitely that uh, ability to see people um, feeling emotions and not being and not hiding emotions and and sharing the emotions with others and yeah. you know and that's something that I don't necessarily feel I'm able to do in every in every other facet of my life because we, we teach ourselves that that's that is not so cool to be emotional you know like yeah. it's not so cool when you're like sad or high hyster you are hysterical if you're angry yeah. woman yes. you know like there's a lot of stigma around like being emotional being weak being emotional is like being weak you know mm -hmm. and um something that i actually wanted to say it's the importance of the dance floor and like allowing yourself to explore yourself etc cetera, etc cetera. and how this for me has come through with drugs a lot but it's not something that I have that I can only achieve through drugs mm. right so I now very often go to dance floors and I am sober completely sober and um, because I have learned what it means to allow myself to have that sort of experience mm. you know now I can bring myself that authenticity to the dance floor without the use of drugs mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. So it's important to see how drugs can be used at one point in your life and then they can teach you something or not teach you anything. Mm. And then, you know, you can learn from that. And it's, it's just a part of your life. It's not, you know, I took drug and that means I'm a drug addict and this is like I, I'm stigmatized forever and I will forever. That's not exactly how it works, right? So now when, when we go to the dance floor, or the dance floor itself is a community where there will be addicts, where there will be drug takers, where there will be people that are drinking, where there will be young people, old people, mm -hmm. people that love music, people that are absolutely hating it, but everyone is just coming together. And yeah. that's a sort of community that is yeah. being built, mm -hmm. that has been built around music, around mm -hmm. the notion of coming together and just dancing and being mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the very special <laughs> like this yeah. is, needs to be understood whenever we talk about drugs or whenever we talk about harm reduction <laughs> mm, mm, yeah <laughs> yeah so community authenticity integration and uh emotions <laughs> where well, i left that if you take anything away from these chat just remember these words and then just and then then yeah just just go on your own journey or reflect on your own journeys yeah. uh, with or without drugs <laughs>